Hi everyone, let's use this uh, video to help us reviewing the electrolyte pH and water balance in our system. Now we'll start with talking about the body water content and there are some statistics here that are not of um, great interest to the exam. But I think they're interesting nevertheless to understand and appreciate so we have the fact here that infants have 73% uh, or more of their body as water. And that's because the body, the, the bones have not developed yet and, um, and uh, they have low body fat. And therefore, most of their body really consists of uh, water. As you can see in later on in life, in adult male, 60% would be water. In adult female, 50% of their body is will be water and that's because of um, more fat and when you have more fat you have less water and in addition to that you also have less skeletal muscle mass uh, in old age as we are all aware uh, we tend to lose the our uh, water percentage and that's because we lose um, our muscle mass and uh, the, 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 there is thinning of the tissues, generalized thinning of the tissues that happens with old age. Um, in addition to just water, we have electrolytes and these dissociate into ions in water, uh, like inorganic salts and acids and bases, like what we learned of sodium, potassium, phosphate, bicarbonate, um, we also learned about the um, the presence of hydrogen ions and all of these we will consider electrolytes. And now these are the most abundant solutes that you will find in any uh, of your body fluids. They have greater osmotic pressure than non-electrolytes and therefore we heard a lot about them when we were talking about the reclaiming or the reabsorption of sodium chloride and water and the role of potassium, the role of urea. All of these guys have indeed uh, a great osmotic power to retain water. And therefore, they, they also determine the chemical physical reaction of fluids, for example, the hydrogen ions, the bicarbonate. And we learned also in, in the nerve physiology and the muscle physiology, the importance of those uh, ions in maintaining the resting membrane potential. And we will talk about this aspect in, in, in brief uh, in a in few slides. If we compare the intracellular and the extracellular fluid, uh, the extracellular fluid um, has higher sodium and uh, chloride compared to the intracellular fluid. And you remember that from the resting membrane potential and how we always said that when uh, the graded or the action potential is initiated, it's always associated with an influx of sodium because the sodium outside is much higher than the sodium inside the cell. Uh, now, the story is a little different uh, when we get into the intracellular fluid. It will have uh, lower sodium and chloride, but it will have potassium as the positive charge or what we call cation. Now the major anion here will be the hydrogen phosphate, HPO4, inside the cells. So here is some distribution and this is again just to give you an overview comparison between the blood plasma which here is in red and the interstitial fluid or the extracellular fluid and then the intracellular fluid here in yellow. So you can compare how sodium is and you can see sodium between the plasma and the extracellular fluid is essentially the same, uh, whereas intracellularly uh, the concentration of sodium is fairly low. And potassium is the reverse story of that. It's low outside and it's pretty high inside. And you can go down the road here to compare between the intracellular and the extracellular concentrations of those uh, solutes. Now, the movement of fluid is really guided by the osmotic pressure and the hydrostatic pressure. The hydrostatic pressure is the physical pressure 
of uh, the fluid either from the inside the vessel or from outside pushing backward and we have a great example in the urinary system as we had both hydrostatic pressure that was from within uh, the the uh, capillaries, the glomerular capillaries pushing the fluid outside. But we also had hydrostatic pressure fighting back, which was the Bowman capsule resistance or the capsular resistance. The water will move freely according to osmosis. Uh, water go, follows uh, so salts and uh, if you consider um, the relative concentration of urine in a solution, uh, not in a urine, in, in, in a solution, uh, as it is compared to the solutes in that uh, solution, uh, then the concentration of your, uh, if water will be always guided by how much uh, solute you have. So, in another word, uh, in other words, uh, if you have too much sodium chloride uh, in a given in one cup, let's take one cup of water, and we add into it. Um, 20 grams of uh, sodium chloride. Now, the relative concentration of water in that solution uh, is fairly low compared to uh, a glass of water that doesn't have any uh, salt whatsoever. So, it's the relative concentration here which you learned a lot about in, in biology. And that allows water to go or to move uh, toward the the area of higher solute concentration and uh, administering a power which we call the tonicity of that solution if you remember uh, the ions uh, sometimes require active transport or channels active transport it means there is some expenditure of energy channels uh, you will not have uh, that energy expenditure and quite often we have facilitated diffusion, uh, whether in or out of the cell. And in facilitated diffusion, you will have uh, a protein that's helping, but without any expenditure of energy. Sometimes the transport happens in one way, and sometimes you have opposite transport, or what we call antiport, when when the same kind of protein is carrying more than one molecule but in two different direction and what we call antiport. Uh, if we are to consider the water balance and the extracellular fluid osmolality, uh, let's talk first about the water intake. Um, we take approximately two and a half liters of water per day. Some of these are in the form of beverages, some in the form of, uh, of food that is not completely dry. And some of that water comes from metabolic water. What does that mean? It means it's water that's generated because of a metabolic process. But what we're really talking about here is the process of either synthesis, uh, where you have a dehydration reaction, but that's a very small amount of water that can be generated due to this um, reaction or the synthesis reaction, the dehydration reaction. Uh, the other form of making water uh, in a metabolic pathway, if you remember, when we are burning uh, glucose, for example, uh, we are ending up with um, carbon dioxide and also the formation of water. And that's what we mean here by the metabolic water. Now, the water output, uh, there is some insensible water loss uh, from the skin and the lungs. Not necessarily when you sweat too much, but you are losing uh, water through your skin all the time without feeling uh, extra sweating. Um, you know that if you wrap your hand in saran wrap, and then you will see that the water will start to accumulate under the skin, whereas previously you weren't able to see this water. We also see this water in the skin when it's too humid of an environment, and that will not allow the water to evaporate fast because the concentration of water in the air uh, will prevent fast evaporation from your skin, and therefore you see the sweating uh, more um, obvious. Um, in humid uh, environment. Uh, 
That's why we are more susceptible to heat strokes uh, in humid environment because the sweat which is designed to evaporate your, uh, uh, not to evaporate but to reduce your temperature, um, only if it evaporated, if it is evaporated now it has a harder time evaporating and therefore you are suffering from an increased core temperature and you can suffer from heat stroke. Okay, so in addition to this insensible water loss, we also have water loss through the urine, and we spent a whole chapter talking about that. Uh, we lose water through breathing, and you know, all of us who have, um, if you breathe against uh, your glasses when you try to clean them, or you breathe against a mirror, you start to see some uh, condensation of the water that you are losing without, without really sensing that uh, water loss. But then we can also have actual perspiration, actual sweat, and that we, uh, for, for, for us to see this, um, we either, the temperature goes high or um, due to some um, sympathetic innervation, which will result in uh, sweat uh, being uh, noticed. Feces, believe it or not, is also another way how we lose water. And that becomes very obvious when someone is suffering from severe diarrhea and can get into hypovolemic shock because of the severe loss of water and electrolytes in the feces. How do we regulate the water intake? We have a thirst mechanism that drives uh, the force for water intake. Uh, the hypothalamic uh, thirst center or osmoreceptors can be stimulated by uh, a, a, a drop in or a drop in the plasma osmolality, actually an increase in the plasma osmolality that this is not uh, accurate here. It has to be an increase in the osmotic pressure of uh, the plasma. I apologize for the mistake. And uh, it's also stimulated, the, the thirst center is stimulated by angiotensin 2, also stimulated by a reduced uh, blood pressure from the baroreceptors. It is stimulated by uh, dry mouth. Um, all of these factors will allow you, along with, uh, like I said here, substantial decrease in blood pressure or blood volume, all of these will result in stimulating the thirst center and that will drive you to drink uh, more fluid. And we know that in hot temperature where we go to beverages and we start to drink something. And the colder the beverage is, the better the quenching of the thirst. Apparently there are some receptors in the stomach and in the esophagus which can immediately quench that thirst through an immediate reflex. And they found that, especially in animals, by intubating the esophagus, therefore the water they're drinking, it's not going to even reach the stomach. And they realized just by watering the mouth of these animals, um, you can block the thirst um, uh, reflex, at least for a while, um, just because you inhibited those uh, receptors or you satisfied those, you satisfied those uh, thirst receptors in the mouth. So drinking water uh, will create inhibition of the thirst center, obviously. And inhibitory feedback will be uh, the, the relief of the dry mouth or the activation of stomach or intestinal stretch receptors. And these will result in the fact that now you are killing that thirst um, center. Um, we lose water all the time, and like I said earlier, there are some, in, in the previous chapter, there are some water that you cannot maintain, that you have to lose, and we call that the obligatory water losses. Even though if you are not drinking at all, and if you are in a state of severe dehydration, still you will be losing this amount of water. And that can be insensible water loss from the skin and the, the lungs. The feces need to lose, some of the water will be lost in the feces. And there is minimum daily sensible water loss in the urine, which is approximately 500 ml. And that is, that is highly needed 
to excrete the waste. Now the story is different in some animals. Some animals that live in a completely dry environment, they have adapted their system that they secrete much or excrete much less amount of urine and that they are capable of making a very highly concentrated urine as a result. Now the water and the sodium content are regulated by mechanisms and we did talk about those mechanisms earlier. Some of those are maintained by the autonomic nervous system like the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Some of them are maintained by the aldosterone and we're going to measure the, we're going to mention the aldosterone one more time and the angiotensin. Some of these mechanisms are mediated by antidiuretic hormone or what we call vasopressin. All of these guys are capable of regulating your water levels and the sodium level, as you will see in this summary presentation. If we talk about the antidiuretic hormone, antidiuretic hormone, we agreed earlier that it is a hormone produced by the hypothalamus and it's stored in the posterior pituitary. Now, in the presence of antidiuretic hormone, you are able to produce concentrated urine. Why is that? Because the antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, can bind to specific receptors that are present in the collecting duct and in the distal convoluted tubule. And it will allow the aquaporins to uh, establish themselves at the membrane, repositioning of the aquaporins into the membrane. And therefore, you are allowing the retaining of more retention of water. And that, of course, we will need when we are in dire need of water, like you are thirsty, dehydrated, uh, you haven't been drinking, you are fasting, you are in the desert, you are in a hypovolemic shock. All of these uh, situations, we did talk about them when we were covering together the urinary system and how the antidiuretic hormone helps you maintaining your uh, water levels. Now the opposite is true. Let's say you have been drinking a lot and now you don't need the antidiuretic hormone or especially if there is alcohol involved that's a strong inhibitor for antidiuretic hormone and therefore you're producing a large amount of urine and of dilute urine and uh, it would reduce the, the volume uh, of your body fluids as, uh, as a consequence. So um, the the Hypothalamic osmoreceptors, these are the switch on and off for the antidiuretic hormone. But in addition to that, we have other factors that will come in and will um, trigger the release of antidiuretic hormone. And whether these are fever, sweating, vomiting, or aldosterone, or the involvement of angiotensin, all of these uh, will indeed change or activate the antidiuretic hormone secretion. But in addition to them, also fever will stimulate the antidiuretic hormone secretion, vomiting, diarrhea, blood loss, because all of these will result in uh, lowering your uh, blood pressure and blood volume, and therefore you can activate through the baroreceptors in your system, and those more receptors, you can activate the secretion of the antidiuretic hormone. Here's some diagram that uh, explains what uh, we were talking about. And it's an interesting diagram for you to use in your review. So um, in case if a person goes into dehydration, what happens? Uh, then you have negative fluid balance. You're losing more water than you should. And essentially your cells will start to shrink because first it will affect, when you lose water, it initially will affect your extracellular fluid. But when you affect the extracellular fluid amount of water or concentration of water, that means the extracellular fluid now or extracellular space or interstitial space will have um, a higher osmotic pressure and it will start dragging the water from the cells, causing some cells to shrink. And so there, there are uh, problems that can be um, observed with the person in dehydration. And we all saw that you know, in movies and stuff when someone is dehydrated on an island, on a deserted island, and uh, they're weak, they uh, they can be, they can have mental confusion. And uh, in extreme cases, they can get into hypovolemic shock because of the loss of water. 
if you lose too much water that will not allow the neurons and the muscles and everything in your body to function within the normal range um, because many of the enzymes and the, the proteins inside our system the mechanisms even to make ATP they demand the very specific um, both pH and also they demand the specific um, Osmolality. Now, the problem also when you are messing up your um, your uh, water levels is the fact that you will not be able to excrete hydrogen ions as you should in the urine because you're not making enough urine, and therefore um, you will when you get into a hypovolemic shock, it's sometimes associated also with acidosis, and that that ruins it even further for you. So here is just a, a, a cartoon for you showing you that when you are losing uh, too much water from the extracellular fluid, now the osmotic pressure will rise in the extracellular fluid, causing the cells to shrink. The opposite is true in overhydration. Well, how does it happen when someone is overhydrated? It's very rare unless someone has a problem with uh, aldosterone or the mechanisms for retaining sodium. It's very rare to get into um, uh, into overhydration unless someone drinks too much water, like you see those, um, I would say, not very smart people um, competing against against each other. How you know how many glasses of water you can drink, and they go crazy and they drink 50 glasses of water. Now your body doesn't have the immediate ability to get rid of the excess amount of water. So this water will get in and it will take some time to get it out and then you will end up with having very low osmotic pressure resulting in the swelling of the brain, cerebral edema, muscular cramps and that can cause sudden death in, in, in these situations where you are essentially pouring cells into the cell and causing the cells to swell. So. Other disorders that are not totally related to um, the osmotic pressure inside the cells or, or shrinking or overhydrating a cell to swell is the fact if we have both water and salt being uh, dumped into the interstitial space. And that's a situation we call edema. We did talk about that when we, uh, when we were talking about the cardiovascular system. Um, where uh, this edema can happen because of increase in blood pressure, it can happen because of increase of permeability, it can happen because the person has very low protein content and therefore uh, in severe anemia and therefore his ability to, or the colloidal pressure ability to hold the water inside the capillaries has been now compromised. There is widespread inflammation with increased permeability of, of the tissues, uh, such as in anaphylactic shock, in congestive heart failure. All of these situations will result in the accumulation of uh, fluid in the interstitial space. Now, that fluid will uh, be hindered. It could be hindered from entering again. And that's like I said, if someone has a hypoproteinemia, low protein amount because of uh, malnutrition or starvation of some sort, and then the fluid will fail to return because there is no colloidal pressure bringing it back at the venous end. And that results, of course, in, uh, in edema. The edema can be generalized or localized, as we discussed. Generally, localized edema, it means there is something blocking that particular vein. And it can be also like postural edema or, or there is a tumor or something pressing on the vein and therefore uh, there is more edema on that particular side. Okay, so the edema we did cover in great details when we were talking about the cardiovascular system. So I'm going to continue to the more relevant topics to our chapter, which is the electrolytes. Now the electrolytes we'll talk about would be the salts, the acids, the bases. And the electrolyte bases, uh, the electrolyte balance usually refers only to salt balance, whereas pH balance we will refer into acid and base. So we'll talk about one at a time and we'll start of course with sodium being the major um, cation.
that we have in the extracellular space and it's really the one that is modulating your blood volume it is really the one that's modulating it to greater extent uh, your um, uh, interstitial fluid volume and so we will spend a good amount of time talking about the sodium regulation which we are already familiar with from discussing the urinary system so uh, the salt we all know the importance of salt they are important for the excitability of neurons and muscles they're important for the fluid movements in and out of the cells secretory activity membrane permeability all of these things will be the salts will participate in so as i said we're gonna focus a little on on the sodium before we move any further uh, any change in the sodium, a plasma sodium can affect the plasma volume and consequently your blood pressure. It will affect the intracellular fluid and the interstitial fluid volumes. It will also affect your renal ability to control the acid-base balances because in many cases these are coupled with the sodium ion. And as we will see, or we already saw that when we were talking about the excretion of hydrogen and how the hydrogen excretion is performed in part by an antiport that carries sodium into the cell from the lumen, from the filtrate, and dumping out uh, hydrogen ions and therefore um, the, the, uh, the pH of the urine is, gener is generally acidic. We also talked that we have active uh, hydrogen pumps. So these are active transport channels or active transport pumps that are present also in the kidneys to pump, actively pump hydrogen into the lumen to be excreted. But we're talking now about the sodium balance. What's interesting about the sodium is that your body doesn't necessarily feel sodium itself, but you feel the consequence of having too much sodium, sodium or too, much, too little sodium. Because sodium and water are, are bound together, your feeling for sodium will be reflected by your feeling for water. So if you have too little sodium, that means your, um, your osmotic pressure will change and therefore you will start feeling your... Um, your uh, osmotic pressure in need of uh, rectification. Uh, conversely, if your uh, sodium is too high and now your osmotic pressure is also high, and if that happens, if your osmotic pressure is high, so you're retaining, you are retaining high amounts of fluid into your inside your blood. And that will result, of course, in elevation of the blood pressure. So essentially, you can sense sodium, but indirectly. We don't have a regulator for sodium. So don't ever think that aldosterone will come as a direct consequence of having um, too little sodium in the blood because we don't have uh, sodium uh, monitors in, in your system, direct sodium uh, receptors in your system. The only re sodium receptor we learned about, but it was doing really the opposite thing, was in the macula densa, if you remember, part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus, where uh, it will be stimulated by sodium that you are losing in your tubules, and therefore it will help you retaining that sodium, whether by activating the renin system or by the granular cells or the smooth muscle cells in the afferent artery will contract and therefore reduce the filtration. Um, so, but we do have a receptor which is for potassium and the potassium levels, if they go up in your blood, you are supposed to respond to that by secreting more uh, aldosterone. Now, aldosterone will get rid of potassium, but it will also retain sodium so it will shift things back. But we don't have receptors, direct receptors for sodium. That's what I'm trying to say. The sodium reabsorption, 65% of it. You rem if you remember when we were um, discussing together the, the, um, the urinary system, we did discuss together that in, during the glomerular filtration, you are essentially losing everything that's small enough to pass through the filtration membrane. 
and then it will be the function of your kidneys then to reabsorb everything you lost um, not everything but everything you need from the stuff you lost so you are reabsorbing most of the sodium back you are reabsorbing some of the potassium back the calcium you are reabsorbing the amino acids you are reabsorbing the the uh, proteins that snuck through you will reabsorb them through uh, fa uh, through endocytosis and you will reabsorb um, glucose by uh, symports that are coupled with the sodium and we did talk about all that uh, earlier on as part of the urinary system so 65 percent of the sodium will be absorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule and 25 will be claimed at the loop of henley if you add them up together that's about 90 percent if you go back you will remember that the glomerular filtration was uh, about 180 liters and so there are a lot of sodium still to be picked up and there are a lot of water that follows the sodium if you bring in sodium the water as a consequence will also follow and that will be in the remaining part so it's the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct these will be both of them both the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct in the collecting duct we have cells called the principal cells and they will be under the control of a hormone called um, aldosterone now what the aldosterone does it will install um, sodium pumps uh, in, in, in your cells and sodium potassium pumps and therefore it drags sodium from the cells into the interstitial space and as we discussed when the cells have lower sodium concentration it will start dragging the salt from your uh, tubules from the lumen and to help facilitating this process aldosterone also installs leaky channels leaky sodium channels at the base at the luminal end of these uh, cells so on one hand you are pumping the sodium into the interstitial space and on the other hand you are allowing more and more sodium to leak through from the lumen into the cells and then it will be pumped later on by the uh, by the sodium potassium pumps you just install so if we have antidiuretic hormone uh, then water also will follow why is that because water does not work or does not go through the same channels as sodium water needs its own channels and if you have enough aquaporins then you will be claiming a lot of the water as a consequence of claiming uh, the salt as well if you do that then you are uh, with the sodium with the aldosterone you will be indeed retaining the salt and retaining the sodium chloride will follow and water also will follow only if antidiuretic hormone is present if you have too much salt if you have too much sodium we did talk about that uh, in in your distal convoluted tubule and uh, that's as a result of maybe too much glomerular filtration rate uh, then we have the macula densa that is capable of sensing this too much sodium being in the distal convoluted tubule and they will send the signal for the renin angiotensin to correct the situation and fire in uh, more aldosterone and working on other mechanisms that we discussed together when we were talking about the urinary system that are aimed to uh, reduce the sodium loss now i want you to remember two things here the importance of aldosterone uh, where it's coming from from the suprarenal gland uh, where does it affect it affects uh, the kidney both at uh, the distal convoluted tubule and uh, the the collecting duct in addition to that which i don't think i have it in my slides but angiotensin also can help you uh, in in maintaining some of the sodium as well it can increase the sodium reabsorption as well but at different cells at different levels versus what you see here with the aldosterone.
So if we go into a summary slide here of showing the sodium uh, reabsorption, over here you lost about 100%. You have in the lumen 100% of the sodium that you filtrated here from the glomerular capillaries. By the time it passes through the proximal convoluted tubule, you have about 70% left. And by the time it passes through the loop of Henley, actually by the time it passes here, uh, the, by the proximal convoluted tubule, you have about much more than that. You have maybe 70% uh, uh, being absorbed, not 70% being held, I apologize. But at the loop of Henley, 20% will be absorbed. And that's very close to the numbers you saw earlier, 65% and 25%. That's pretty much the same thing. It depends on which book you're reading. 6% will be reabsorbed at the distal convoluted tubule, whereas 3% will be reabsorbed at the collecting duct. And we agreed that the reabsorption here in the distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting duct will be under the direct influence of aldosterone. So... Aldosterone again, how does it get uh, stimulated? Well, it gets stimulated either by sympathetic activation of the granular cells, by uh, reduction of the filtrate osmolality, and uh, in that case, it will tell you that um, you have, um, you need to retain uh, more, uh, you, you need to retain, retain more um, salt uh, by reduction of the stretch onto the, the, the capillaries, and if you reduce the stretch, uh, then it will tell you that, well, maybe the blood pressure is low, and maybe it's time now to uh, secrete aldosterone, and aldosterone will work on uh, retaining the salt, and therefore can increase the blood pressure. And when you increase the blood pressure, then you uh, are increasing the stretch on the afferent artery. And as we remember together, uh, renin will be secreted from the, those granular cells. It will uh, catalyze the reaction where angiotensinogen will become angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted mainly in the lung into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is the one that is either acting directly on the kidneys or releasing antidiuretic hormone or causing you to have the thirst, thirst uh, reflex or incre increase the blood pressure or um, stimulating the production of aldosterone. Okay? Uh, aldosterone effect lasts for quite some time, so that's that's not an acute regulation. That's more of a stable regulation of your blood pressure and salt concentrations. Opposite to the effect uh, I just mentioned to you is the effect of the atrial natriuretic peptide that will be released in in response to stretching the heart, stretching mainly the left atrium. And when you stretch the left atrium, then you have this uh, peptide that its main function is to reduce antidiuretic hormone, is, redu is, is uh, reduce the uptake of sodium, and therefore you reduce the uptake of water. And therefore, as a consequence, you're increasing the excretion of sodium and water into the urine. So it really acts in an opposite effect to that we talked about the aldosterone. In addition to this, anti uh, AMP atrial natriuretic peptide is also a vasodilator. So we are doing this in order for us to reduce the blood pressure because the blood pressure now is strong enough to stretch the atrium. And it's a reflex, it's a protective mechanism to, to, to help yourself against overstretching and against uh, too much increase in your blood pressure. So... Other hormones, we do know that estrogen, estrogens, for example, they increase the sodium chloride uh, reabsorption, just like aldosterone. And uh, there, is, there is some theory suggesting that estrogen is, is working as a, a mimic for aldosterone because the, the structure is fairly similar. And when it binds to the same aldosterone receptor, then it would stimulate pretty much the same effect. 
And we, see, we know that and we see that in, for example, in pregnancy where water is being retained. And we also see that in, in, uh, in, in times during the, the um, menstrual period. And that's the reason why people who have high blood pressure, they are usually warned and monitored if uh, those women are using contraceptive pills because in contraceptive pills, the main ingredient is estrogen, and uh, estrogen will help you retaining salt and, and water, and that in itself can increase the blood pressure. So therefore, it's, it's a sort of a red flag if someone has uh, high blood pressure. Now, progesterone will do the, the opposite. Progesterone uh, seems to allow sodium to be excreted, so it blocks the aldosterone rather than mimicking the aldosterone and it will promote sodium and water loss in this case. Glucocorticoids such as cortisone, it can, just like estrogen, can mimic the function of aldosterone and can cause sodium retention and the sodium retention will cause edema. And we will see that in particular when we get into uh, the endocrine system when we talk about conditions like uh, Cushing syndrome, where there is too much retention of, um, of sodium and that causes edema, generalized edema. Uh, we do have regulation of uh, your blood pressure, and we learned about that when we discussed together the, the cardiovascular system. And those sensors, those receptors are called baroreceptors, and will tell you whether you have too much blood pressure, too little blood pressure, Essentially, if you have too high blood pressure, so the reflex immediately will be to increase the glomerular filtration, to allow sodium and water to leave, and therefore you are correcting your blood pressure, and the opposite is true. So we did talk about that when we covered the cardiovascular system and the urinary system when we talked about the glomerular filtration, and one of the mechanisms through which the glomerular filtration can be regulated is by the sympathetic innervation. We did talk about that as well. Here's an interesting chart that will help you also in summarizing the parts that we covered already and the regulation of the sodium and the water losses. Now, opposite to sodium is the regulation of potassium. Potassium, as you remember, is supposed to be inside the cells. You're not supposed to have too much potassium in your uh, plasma. Essentially, too much potassium in, in, in your plasma is something you uh, do not want because it will reduce the excitability of your cells and can result into hyperkalemia, which, is, which can be a fatal situation. So if you have a high extracellular fluid concentration of potassium, that would reduce the resting membrane potential, uh, potential and therefore um, you will reduce the excitability of the nerves and the muscles. Now this, this is the easy story, but really there are two kinds of hyperkalemia. One of them is acute hyperkalemia, where the concentration of potassium jumped too high, too sudden, and there is a chronic hyperkalemia, which, which takes time. And the, the results are slightly different between, um, between the chronic and the acute hyperkalemia. But nevertheless, you need to regulate the concentration of potassium. Aldosterone is the, is, is the good regulator for the potassium concentration if it jumps to become too high because it's capable of installing sodium potassium pumps in your kidney and therefore allowing the kidney, the principal cells in the collecting duct as well as the distal convoluted tubule cells to uh, kick out potassium as needed. But we also have intercalated cells. This is the different type of cells that can be present, that are present in the collecting duct. And these guys, they work on um, playing with antiports to keep not sodium but potassium in if needed or excreting it out if you want to. And that will be a different kind of regulation of uh, the potassium concentration that we'll talk about. So if we go into a little details on this, uh, the potassium balance is, is controlled by um, your uh, aldosterone. If you have too much potassium, it would, it would stimulate the aldosterone 
and the aldosterone will favor the excretion of sodium from the principal cells and from the distal convoluted tubules. The principal cells, as I mentioned over and over, it's part of the collecting ducts. When potassium levels are too low, then there are the intercalated cells that can help you or can help to reabsorb some potassium that's left in the filtrate. And uh, that's through a completely different mechanism other than the aldosterone. Remember, the aldosterone kicks the potassium out uh, uh, into the urine, but uh, other mechanisms will be designed to bring in potassium in case the potassium is low. Again here, the influence of aldosterone, it will stimulate the potassium secretion and the sodium reabsorption because it will install these sodium potassium pumps and it would, if you have an increased potassium, the regulation of aldosterone, if you have increased potassium, that will fire aldosterone, which will allow the potassium secretion. So here is the feedback mechanism we have. If we have a lot of aldosterone, that will allow potassium to be secreted. And if we have too much potassium, it will allow aldosterone to be secreted. And therefore, we have established here the the feedback loop between the concentration of potassium and the concentration of aldosterone. And we'll cover that again when we get into the, uh, the endocrine system, when we talk about the suprarenal gland or the adrenal cortex. And we'll talk again one more time about the aldosterone when we get there. Calcium, uh, just like everything else, uh, was also lost uh, unless it's bound to a big protein and we do need to maintain a good amount of calcium in our system. If you remember, calcium was needed for um, the, the neuromuscular excitability. It's, it's needed for uh, the release of uh, the acetylcholine from the vesicles. If you remember from the blood clotting, one of the blood clotting factors was calcium. It's highly needed and that's why when we want to prevent the blood clotting, we add something that will chelate calcium away, such as EDTA or EGTA will, will chelate calcium and therefore blood clotting doesn't occur. So we do need the calcium for more than a reason. So we definitely have to regulate it very tightly. If we have hypocalcemia, now remember there are hypokalemia, which is potassium, and hypocalcemia, which is the calcium. If we have too little put if, if we have too little calcium that will uh, increase the excitability and can result in tetany of the muscles if you have too much calcium that can also cause arrhythmia so we do have to maintain a, a fairly steady level of calcium it is in fact controlled mainly by a hormone and we will study that hormone in great details when we get into the endocrine system called the parathyroid hormone the parathyroid hormone comes from focal glands that are embedded in the back of the thyroid gland called parathyroid gland. And uh, its function will be to A, uh, liberate some of the calcium that's in your bone by the function of cells called osteoclasts. And like I said, we will cover that when we get into the endocrine system. Osteoclasts will, will mobilize some of the calcium and therefore your calcium concentration will go up. At the same time, uh, parathyroid hormone will also stimulate uh, your kidneys to convert vitamin D into the active vitamin D. And when you have active vitamin D, then from the precursor, then you will allow more reabsorption of calcium, or not reabsorption, but more absorption of calcium from your intestine. And that's the main function of vitamin D, to allow the absorption of calcium from the intestine. In addition to that, the parathyroid hormone can also affect the uh, tubules in your kidney to install more uh, channels for specifically for calcium and therefore you can claim more calcium but at the same time you don't want phosphate to be there because calcium if it finds phosphate then it will precipitate so it will allow phosphate to be excreted uh, but calcium to be retained and those are the functions of the parathyroid hormone 
calcitonin, they think that it has functions, but I think it's more uh, profound in animals, but it's not that strong of a function in human being. So bones are the largest reservoir, and we'll study that again in the endocrine system for calcium and phosphate. Parathyroid hormone, or PTH, it promotes the increase of calcium levels by targeting the bones. How does it target the bones? By activating the osteoclasts, and the osteoclasts will, re will release calcium and phosphate. By targeting the kidney by, uh, and causes reabsorption of calcium, but it also activation of vitamin D. And when vitamin D is activated, then it will affect the absorption of calcium from your small intestine. Calcium and reabsor the calcium reabsorption and phosphate excretion have to go has to go hand in hand. Why? Because otherwise you end up with um, unfavorable precipitation of calcium salt, calcium phosphate everywhere or what we call calcification so the kidneys will start to become calcified and the connective tissues and the muscles so if you want your calcium levels to be high you need to get rid of the phosphate which is something the parathyroid hormone is capable of doing here's another summary slide for what we talked about earlier in the, today and here is the parathyroid gland and it secretes the parathyroid hormone what it does it goes to the bones and activate the osteoclasts that will release calcium and phosphate and then it goes to the kidneys the kidneys will activate vitamin d that's one but it also allows the reabsorption of calcium and the excretion of potassium vitamin d that got activated here in the kidney can go into the intestine and allow more absorption of calcium from the intestine. This is the homeostasis of calcium and phosphate uh, in your system. Um, so what else does the parathyroid hormone does? 75% uh, of the filtered phosphate are actively reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubules. As I said earlier, in the presence of parathyroid hormone, you will reduce the the transfer maximum of or the tubular maximum of uh, for the, the the phosphate and therefore at the proximal convoluted tubules you will reduce the reuptake or reabsorption of uh, phosphate and therefore you will have uh, uh, you will have higher calcium but lower phosphate and as we described earlier, phosphate is not something you want to be elevated if your calcium is high because that can result in spontaneous deposition of the calcium salt. So here is a diagram for you for the reabsorption of uh, calcium in your tubules. Again, you are excreting or you are releasing 100% into the glomerular filtration of the unbound, remember this word, of the unbound uh, calcium. Any calcium that is bound to big globulin uh, or any other albumin uh, protein will have a very hard time passing through the membrane because uh, what we described earlier is the glomerular filtration membrane uh, ability to pass only small molecules. So here we will have the 100% of the calcium being filtrated. 60% will be taken back at the proximal convoluted tubule. By the time it goes through the loop of Henle, you will have only 10% left in the distal convoluted tubule. And here there will be more, be more reabsorption. And by the time it passes through the urine, only about 1% of whatever you filtrated here will be lost in the urine. So these were the positive or the cations. Uh, we talked about sodium and uh, we did describe the regulation of calcium and potassium as well. Uh, chloride is the major anion in the extracellular fluid and it helps maintaining the osmotic pressure along with the sodium. 99% of the chloride ion is reabsorbed under normal pH conditions and when acidosis occurs then fewer chloride ions are reabsorbed because 
you will need to get rid of some hydrogen ions and uh, you will couple that uh, with some chloride you will you will sacrifice some chloride ions in order for you to get rid of your hydrogen ions other anions uh, have a transport maximum and uh, their excess is excreted in the urine um, we don't have to go into great details about the other anions I, I just want you to focus on the chloride and the 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 phosphate being also um, uh, a negatively charged ion uh, the third one will be the carbonate and we will have a, a, a whole section about that when i start talking about the uh, acid base balance we will refer to the carbonate and the carbonate do indeed have a negative charge and we will see how we regulate that in in a short bit so I'm going to stop here for this uh, first uh, part of my lecture and uh, I will continue in the second part with the acid-base balance where we will learn how uh, not only the kidneys but also your plasma proteins, the blood, uh, your respiratory system uh, is capable of regulating your acid-base balance and uh, we will uh, uh, summarize together things we learned in the blood, in uh, the respiratory system, and in the urinary system uh, into what we describe here as acid-base balance. And this is what we will start with in the second part of uh, this uh, review video. So have a good day.